you all. Welcome to this new episode of Carolyn Talks. I am your host, film critic and journalist, Carolyn Hines. And this is the podcast slash YouTube channel where I speak to film creatives around the world about their work, the industry, and what inspires them. And today is a special episode. It's a podcast episode, so there'll be no video to go with this. With actor Hamza Haq and actress Anna McGuire about their new film with love and a major organ, directed by Kim Albright and written by Julia Ladera. And this is a great conversation that I had with Hamza and Anna. And we spoke about love and what love means to them and also what love means to their characters, George and Annabelle. And Annabelle, she lives in a society where everyone is like trying to be the same. And I think it's also a critique of how social media is changing our culture and changing society to become less, um, what's the word I'm like, involved with each other, you know, as we become more involved with this um, social media, our lives are taking place more online than in person. And the film is talking about that and how the character of Annabelle, she's still very much about being in touch with her feelings and being emotionally connected to the people around her. You know, she wears bright colors while everyone else is in muted shades. And then there's the car- color, the character George, who who is very reserved and he's very, um like he he's not emotionless, but like his emotions are more repressed, you know? And so he's a character who's like, who is like fully integrated into the society that it is. So first of all, thank you, Am Hamza. Thank you, Anna, for joining me to talk about with love and a major organ. Mm. Um, I want to first ask the both of you, um, it may seem like a pretty passy question, but what does love mean to each of you? And it, it could be it could be romantic love, it could be eros love, friendship, you know, there's so many different forms of love, but what would you say would be your general idea of love is first? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, love, I mean, for me, Love is something that keeps growing Mm. the older I get. I think the more love and heartbreak and hate and pain one experiences, the more love I find grows. Um, Sort of something that my mum always said, she was always like, oh, when when I had you, I I didn't realise I could love someone so much. When Mm. I had your sister, I didn't even realise I could love that much more. And... um, and I, yeah, I feel, I feel that um, more and more as I get older and older. And I, I'd be, I'll be interested to see where I end up in, in uh, twenty, thirty years time in that mm-hmm. on that question. But it does feel like there is a constant. If you let it, love mm. grows. Mm. Mm. Yeah, what about you, Hansa? I think love is. I mean, it's it's essentially just service, isn't it? Like it's, you have to. You have to put work in. Uh, you, you you do it because you have this inherent need to, uh, almost a compulsive need to make sure that something is okay. Mm. That that something, you know, like Anna said, that something grows to dedicate yourself to anything, be it a, a project, the way you uh, bake your cup of coffee, uh, a loved one, a partner, a child, anything, a movie. Mm. You know, you're, you become connected through serving something that's, Bigger than the sum of its parts, exactly. I guess, on some level. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, love is a tremendously um, collaborative concept, <laughs> you know, um, and that's, it, I mean, that, that goes to, you know, that's, that's self-love as well. You have to work with all of yourself and self-love really happens when you work with all the different parts of yourself, including and almost especially the parts of yourself that you don't like, mm-hmm. in the sense of, you know, to with joy and full conviction do something that you might not want to do like i don't know clean up you know clean up you know what i mean yell at your kid you know do something like that you know you don't want to argue with these things but because you love the thing you have to Mm, so your i think both of your definitions are kind of the living in the same zone like for yours yours is like love is expansive it grows and it contracts and like you know it can shrink depending on the situation you're in and it can grow if like as you use your mom's definition like the more people you add into your life the, the bigger your love grows and and for you Hamza yours is like um, acts of service love is acts of service mm-hmm. you know like doing something and you do that because your love for whoever is in your life grows mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it expands and it grows and it can contract but down to like the minutia like do, just cleaning up a living room the mm-hmm. late living room is an act of service for yourself mm-hmm. like cleaning yeah. for yourself you mm-hmm. said I love myself therefore I shall put my effort in 
to cleaning up the space that I inhabit and I live in, right? Yeah. And it's kind of ironic that you both actually came with those ex those explanations because I think it kind of fits this film because for like the characters, um, Annabelle, like her love, it literally grows and then it shrinks, mm. and then to the, to the point that it not to spoil it, but like in a way almost disappears. Mm. But I don't think it ever truly disappears. I think it just shrank. And like, it was in a form that she couldn't recognize. And for your, the character of yours, George, um, his love was there, but he didn't know how to process it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think love is, I don't think in the film, like love doesn't exist for him. He just didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. well, he didn't know what form it could form. And love is, I mean, I think on some level with, your, with the George and Mona's relationship, she, she loves him so much that she, unwittingly or wittingly you know kind of harms him mm -hmm. in some way this this idea of protecting and love and those sort of complex ties <laughs> like, don't we all <laughs> well, well exactly i yeah. think that sort of the more we speak about the film actually the more i i sort of i, I realize how complex yeah. and, and nuanced and well, it is such a a study of love but but it isn't necessarily a traditional romantic love story i think and that's uh, therein lies it's sort of um it, it, slipperiness yeah yeah i, I don't wow. think i didn't i didn't see their love as romantic at first even though i think for annabelle she did i kind of saw their love as being like this exploration of what it means to welcome somebody into your life just like that mm -hmm. you know like Openness. annabelle she's so open she's like oh wait I think I love this man, even though we've exchanged like maybe five words. And it wasn't necessarily romantic love. I think it was just like, she's like, oh, this is a new form of love. You know, I can love a perfect stranger, you know? And for his, and for George's mom, Mona, she's interesting because when the revelation, the, because the way how um, she's introduced in the film, she seems very cold and very standoffish. And like their setting is very um, monotone. Their mm -hmm. life is monotone. Their life is no color. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's because she's so afraid of what love can do that she removed what she thought could be signs of love, mm -hmm. you know, which is color, taste, flavor. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, fish can have flavor, lady, but if you're not making any seasonings, it's not going to flavor. But she removed that because she's like, because she, she even saw like the taste of food could be, could lead to some kind of trouble for him. She's like, if you fall too much in love with food, like Greek, like food, like pizza, mm -hmm. she was like, this can lead to a path of trouble for you. But you can't escape love, you know, you can't escape life because that's human emotion and the film is very interesting where like the title is with love and a major organ meaning the heart but like love doesn't exist physically in our heart mm -hmm. it's a just it's a thing that is a part of us mentally you know mm -hmm. i think to me i remember a friend of mine said years ago and it stuck with me she's like love is a principle mm -hmm. yeah and she's like love is principle because mm -hmm. if you go strictly on emotions like emotions are fleeting you can be angry one minute and like 100 percent. right and she's like but love is emotion is a principle because you got to dedicate time to that so i want the both of you to talk about the principle of love in your characters mm -hmm. because i think the principle in love for um annabelle in particular is like she does acts of service for her friend casey you mm -hmm. know that's how she shows love that's mm -hmm. her principle to be there for the people in her lives like her mom she couldn't get through to her mom but she kept calling because she's like this is how i'm going to show my mom that i love her this is my principle of love and i think even for george like he didn't know who annabelle was in his life he didn't know what the potential was but he was still open to her Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't know what to call it, but he's like, you know what? Like, this is someone that I could potent potentially let into my life. So, I want you both to talk about the principle of love in your characters because I think you're actually like really like in mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. And you go first, Hamza, because you uh, like, absolutely. Well, first. first things first, I want to know what island nation you're from. Cause, Barbados. Yeah, because I'm just like, you're commenting on unseasoned fish real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, just, just like, that fish was so black. Uh, <laughs> You could not have revealed yourself more in yeah. that moment. Uh, uh, you're like, yeah, omega threes are fine. I like, you know, yeah, I mean, I like, put some spice on it. Put some, put some cilantro. Not even cilantro, some parsley. Anything. Just some salt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like no. the pepper. Yeah. The pepper's color, no color. Yeah. Um, I think. Um, you know, this is you know increasingly popular saying about um, grief just being love with nowhere to go mm -hmm. uh, and, and nowhere to put it. And I think that's that's George um, throughout the beginning of that, like the the principle of of having all that love inside. But uh, you know, if we think of the heart as the as as not the the container of love, but the engine by which love is exercised. 
and for him not to have the agency or the access to that um, to do that it just built up this sort of constant um, state of just not sadness but his uh, total um, acceptance of, of where he is in life without uh, complacency you know that's, that's what I mean there the, the complacency with which, what he has with his life not having flavor or color and everything like that but there's a bravery in, in just being okay with it mm-hmm. he's, he's not he hasn't victimized himself to anything he's not going around like oh woe is me and I have nowhere to put my love he's just accepted that like I have a lot of love inside me and there's nothing I can do about it mm-hmm. hmm. okay cool where I find that it, when you say that there's there you know Anna and, and, and George not to speak on um, what, what, what Annabelle is or sorry Annabelle and George, and that's yeah. what Anna is gonna, uh, uh, you know, is gonna say. But we are mirror images of each other in that she has the exact same mechanism, the exact same principle of having all this love and nowhere to put it, except she has an engine that's roaring, mm. and she's just sort of rapid firing it everywhere, and and it's sort of just not sticking. So her, much like her paintings, it's sort of like messy and all over the place. Where George. He doesn't even have color, mm. so I think um, I think for when he when he finally receives the motor or the or the engine, he kind of has this influx of trying everything and giving himself to everything and being in service to you know whatever is around him. If that's petting the dog, if that's talking to strangers, if that's you know getting these uh, you know vintage shirts or these thrift store you know mm. um, you know picking up those dinosaurs it's just for him it's it's something that's been repressed for so long that as soon as he gets the moment he kind of lives the that that you know in this zone of childlike wonder as if he he's discovered music for the first time so um, yeah like I think I think it's something that's constant in both of them especially for George and his lack of understanding of what exactly his grief is coming from is is motivated by that exact principle of love and in seeking some kind of commitment which is why i feel like he has all these questions for his mother in that moment being just like how can we never order food or how can we never talk about feelings or you know what i mean like we, we can't and we can't just talk about it we have to go out there we have to live it we have to act on it you know mm, yeah. so you know love is it's a verb, so it requires action, and, and finally he has um, the tools to act on. Yeah, he didn't hesitate to accept the feelings at all. Like, no, he just like, looked at it. He's just like, like, "Oh, here's a heart in," you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and for Annabelle. Yeah, I mean, I think everything we're saying is super interesting. Um, uh, I think Annabelle, in mirror to to, to George, is. Um, she's at the end of her tether with love, mm. actually. I, and I think this sort of the fine line between a desperate act and a, a loving act is something that she, that sort of, that um, she's walking that tightrope uh, when we meet her at the beginning of the film. And I think when George rejects her love, she, she in grief gives her heart, both in grief and in love, because as you said, these sort of, mm-hmm. again, mirrors, um, but it is also a very loving act and a very vulnerable act and a very brave act, even if it is also an act of just not being able to cope with the amount of pain that a heart can comes with, you know? Um, and I think sort of she gives, she gives it away. It's almost like passing the baton. Um, and I think what's interesting about the sort of world where... Uh, where hearts are objects and, and they can be kind of imbued with experience or sort of talismanic in some way. Um, she gives her heart and part of what we did in the rehearsals was to sort of figure out our physical mannerisms and what we might, what that might be like with a heart without a heart and what Hamza, obviously taking my cat, well not Hamza but George, taking Annabelle's heart. Mm. Ah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, one for one. Exactly. Um, <laughs> What, what mannerisms or sort of qualities he might have picked mm. up from that heart. And then, obviously, we, we sort of, we, we follow Annabelle and eventually, spoiler, I guess, she gets her heart back. <laughs> um, but, but the thing is, is that what she picked up, what does she pick up from his experience with the heart, right? Mm. This object kind of 
it leaves her and it, it, it gives her I, I think the the capacity the strength to 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 move into the next stage of her life mm. and um well, we see a little bit of that, but but maybe what that might mean in the future and what love might mean, it's, it's reinterpreted by George's childlike experience mm. of love, a love that he's never felt before. And so love actually does become quite sort of, um, I guess, extracted from, it, it becomes quite conceptual, mm. actually, as well as active and, and, and something that both characters practice. It is a kind of musing upon love. And so your mm. question at the beginning about what, what is love to you is, it's a very welcome and very profound question, and I think quite a profound reading on your part of of, of the film, or, or an accurate or something in there. So, so I think it begs the question on what you think uh, love is. Exactly. Yes, I, yeah, you, I, was, yeah. I wanted to be you too, and I'm like, I haven't said it in a while. I know where this is going, so I've got to ask him too. But for me, love is, um, I think love is believing possibilities. Because if you don't believe that there's something to look forward to, to love, whether it's a whether it's a new family member, whether it's a spouse, a partner, getting a dog, you know, if, like loving. I I talk to my plants. I have a dog and I have plants, and I talk to my plants and I love them. But I think love is about possibility, you know, because even if you've been hurt, you gotta learn to and and it may stay with you, it may stick with you, because it doesn't really go away. Because those kind of things leave marks on us. You still gotta open up yourself to a possibility of love in the future. You know, like loving yourself is like looking forward to the future. Love is hope. <laughs> love is hope. You know, and and people will say, oh, that sounds trite, but it's true because it's we're true. as human no. beings, we need something to look forward to. We need to have hope. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to have the a belief that when we wake up tomorrow, that there's something to look forward to in that mm -hmm. day. And in saying that, I'm thinking about George, and I thought what was so what I think what I think um, writer Julia later did really really well is when. Even in the midst of her grief and her rejection and her anger and all of these dark feelings, mm. Annabelle still had hope because she gave her heart to George. She didn't keep it. She didn't put it. She didn't lock it away. Put she it didn't destroy it. She, yeah. didn't, she didn't destroy it. She didn't like dash it out through the window like she was doing with the other memento. She's like, my heart is so precious. Yeah, and, and she it, says that as well. Exactly. She says, be careful with it. it exactly. Breaks easily. She's, and so she's like, and she, right before she says, I hope it haunts you forever. I, know, right? <laughs> I thought that was she's so also vindictive. <laughs> Sense she, that. She's like, I hope, I hope it haunts you. And, but it made sense to me because she and all of them, and it shows like even even when she's turning off her emotions, she doesn't want to destroy the thing that makes her who mm. she is. You know, that's her divine characteristic, her heart, her love, her trust. And she's like, I'm gonna give this to somebody that I see that needs it, mm. right? Because I think she realized that George didn't reject her because he didn't like her, but I think she rejected George because she realized that. He was missing that component. Yeah, he just doesn't have the tools. And he didn't have the engine, and so she gave that away. And I think that's the the thing about what the film is really talking about is for Annabelle, where she's like the one the one bright spark in this film. Like she's the brightest person. Like she's always mm -hmm. the most colorful, and she's always the most positive, and she's performing acts of service for people who don't even like her mm -hmm. or people who don't <laughs> understand her. Like Casey, I'm like Casey. You know this girl. Like you should have expected that she was gonna do something <laughs> unexpected. <laughs> But I'm thinking about how in the dialogue, how that comes through, like, she, like the whole thing with the haunt, I hope it haunts you. But it, I think it showed like that is also just like she has this whole I, this sense of um, humor that other people wouldn't get. Mm. And I wanted to ask you both about the dialogue because it was giving me, not Pride and Prejudice, people say Pride and Prejudice, no, it was giving me Withering Heights. <laughs> You know, it was giving me Charlotte Bronte. It's got some dark. It was got some dark. <laughs> I'm like, and so, because the dialogue, it, it, the, the, the syntax and the structure of the dialogue is very specific. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, it, it doesn't flow evenly, you know, like the way you say things kind of feels like almost like it's felt very Regency era, very Victorian era. And I wanted to ask you both about the lines and reciting the, the dialogue because um, Annabelle has a very specific way of des describing her emotions. She relates a lot, uh, relates a lot of it to food mm -hmm. and cooking. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, and it was interesting because we don't really see her eat. Mm. But she talks about food a lot. She's we're, got a rich cooking life. <laughs> Whereas we're, we're George, he eats. We see George eating, but his food has no flavor. You know. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I want to ask you uh, first, um, Anna, about the dialogue and the. You have the watched script. this film impeccably. I know. I this absolutely. Is, I'm like I died. I, I didn't even realize. I've seen this so many times. I was obsessed with everything. We should have had this yeah. conversation before we did the DVD yeah. commentary. <laughs> <laughs> so I just should have stolen all of your DVD commentary. Yeah. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I was asking you about the dialogue because I was like, why is she 
talks she talks about food and cooking and about the, the textures of food mm. and well i guess it's the texture of life right yeah. it's like what does it mean to, to live it's to touch to feel to smell to mm. it's all sense mm. to nourish yourself so, you know. yeah and well i think julia she's such a um she's a brilliant writer mm. she, she comes from a theater background and so dialogue is her sort of yeah it was bread really, and butter so to it speak. was giving that very dramatic shakespeare like like we just the era pride and prejudice wuthering <laughs> heights like mm -hmm. before the or she's mm -hmm. I'm like girl like she's ready to like be like dramatic but like I really the dialogue I wasn't expecting it to be mm. phrased the way it is mm. yeah I think well I guess it's such a specific world so it's quite heightened mm. so uh, the, the the world that they exist in whilst it's sort of close to the world that we're in I think there's something uh, yeah just slightly heightened slightly to the left Some fantastical yeah or, but but again it's, it's so it's it, I, I like the sort of it's the sublime and the ridiculous that she sort of plays with she, she, she likens herself to a, a lonely meatball and a vat right? of tomato sauce you know which is um <laughs> Quite absurd, really, but 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 yeah. From Titus Andronicus. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's, it's from Act Two. Ah, yeah, things are shaking. Um, quite fitting, actually. Though, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like it's... Exactly. Yeah, tell me you're a theater nerd. Without your... <laughs> um, yeah, so I, and the language actually was quite. Um, tricky, I think, on some level, to to especially the the recording, the, the tape, the, the poetry, mm. uh, because it is spoken quite freely to uh, to George. Mm. Um, but yet, nonetheless, as you say, it has got a heightened register. So it's how to make that feel authentically mm. her uh, without feeling like a kind of imposed narrative. And, and so we did a bunch of work on that. We did, we did some rehearsals. Um, I worked with a really great voice coach, Suzanne Soretta, who comes from sort of a theatre background as well. And, and, and um, just to sort of get the words into your body, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you need, you need to sort of embody that language so that it feels authentic, mm. um, even if it is a slightly strange or, or, or left field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think for George, it kind of the, as again, I, I really do think like both characters are mirror images of each other because the dialogue for George changes. Mm. His is very flat and mm. almost monotone and almost incurious. He doesn't speak with a sense of curiosity, you know, there's no inflections to his voice. Like even when he says, oh, I read the paper the day after, so I already know what happened. But he doesn't deliver it in like an excited way. He's like, mm -hmm. I just, you know, I mean, here's he, the facts. he's like, here's the facts, I do this. But then once he gets the heart, the way he speaks changes. Mm -hmm. Whereas like for Annabelle, the same thing happens. She went from being like, a, a, um, like this dramatic sense of like describing things to very mon uh, monotone and almost robotic. Mm -hmm. And like not emotionless, not not emotional because there's a sense of resentment mm -hmm. that I get in her performance. And like there's a same like she when she says this, I'm like she's she resents that she that she has to speak this way. But for George, he really opens up mm -hmm. his dialogue. He expresses his anger. And like you become very emotive and very childlike mm -hmm. and through a tantrum. So talk about like flipping mm -hmm. the the switch and also in um in working with your director um to really make sure that you don't get too over dramatic to the point where it, like the childishness becomes annoying is and i say that because the childishness has to make sense yeah and, it, and you know rather than it seems like an adult throwing a tantrum it's more like this is a repressed child finally getting a child a chance to grow up yeah there's oh god i'm, I'm in love with your questions mm -hmm. this, is, this, this is spectacular um you know like sorry like we've just spent the whole day talking about like movies and we're talking about like the logistics of making a movie, so just to have sit down and be just like, just talk about love for a bit. I'm just like, oh thank God, this is such a relief, man. I feel like I feel like I've unclenched my bowels for the first time in 24 I hours. I know, I know. <laughs> man. It's like, I'm like, whoa, like this is great. You know what I mean? Like, thank you. Thank you. that yeah. means a lot to me. No, it's, it's spectacular. Thank you. Um, you know, and listeners, you don't need to. You, you don't need to know who else we've been interviewing. So that's why. Um, but. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I've got this, uh, I've been working with the same um, acting coach, Michelle Lonzo-Smith, for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. So when George came around, it was just like, okay, cool, like, we're going to we're gonna try to do something different, where you're just going to have to sit with everything that you feel. Here's somebody who, you know, is just so okay with who he is, and he's not dramatic about it. He doesn't like it. And I am an individual who is not okay with who he is. And I'm tremendously dramatic about it. I have made it. I have made an entire career trying to mask and everything is just fucking okay. I'm, I'm, you He's know, not wrong. He's yeah. not wrong. Yeah. 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 
yeah. but you know what I mean? Like we all do so much to try to mask our insecurities where I don't think, and our insecurities come from some sort of disdain for our life experiences or parts of us that we wish we didn't have or behaviors that we've, you know, exercised, you know, on ourselves or on other people that we really wish we hadn't and things that we wish we could change. And George is somebody who does not wish to change anything. Mm. He's just like, it is what it is. This is who I am. So I, I really had to sit in that in the beginning stages um, of, you know, before in the pre, um, uh, you know, and uh, receiving Annabelle's heart. Um, it was just, yeah, Janine. <laughs> before, before, before he receives <laughs> Janine. Yeah, yeah, it's I a love great that name. Janine um, yeah, before he gets Janine. Um, <laughs> you know just to really sit in there and and that was a that was a difficult task for me because i you know whatever inside work the world doing you have to sit in your own vulnerability for um i'm lucky in that way that acting has saved my life so much that i am willing to do that work Mm. for a part Mm. i i i hadn't even closely approached that work for a relationship for religion for my child even but it was for a part no just like i am I love what I do so much. So in order to be in service to that, I have to do this. So like for the 16 hours a day or however long we were on set, it was just like, buddy, you just gotta, you just gotta sit in that vulnerability be constantly, present. be present. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it, it has changed my life in such a profound way. And it was, it was deeply uncomfortable mm-hmm. to, to do that. Um, working with uh, uh, both my coach and working with Kim, I would say that that scene that George and Mona have uh, when that argument right after he gets that hard, like something's different with you, that is 10 years of a boy's life, mm. you know, in the sense <laughs> that there he goes from, uh, he goes from, uh, you know, toddler to teenager within that conversation mm. because first it's just pure grief and he's sad like I don't know why I'm sad I don't know whatever and then he starts asking questions and then he starts being like what has gotten into you and he goes I don't know <laughs> you know what I mean there's that defiant teenager yeah. comes on and then that rebellious you know uh, or said de- defiant you know uh, preteen and then the rebellious teenager and then I'm moving out and like you know when he says don't follow me it's just like you know, he flips that thing over. I'm just like, okay, cool. In that moment, he flips the uh, the plate over. He's 18 yeah. now. And then when he calmly says, "No, I'm not sorry. Don't follow me." I'm like, okay, cool. He's 21, <laughs> wanting to move to the, <laughs> You're the, like, the big city. Here. You know what I mean? But it but it happens. But he has to grow up that fast yeah. because he's never had that opportunity. Yeah. Right? So so it's that thing that it just it, it is, it, and that was something that we explored because uh, I don't think we ever we ever see it we see one picture of like a child George yes. versus an old picture of me yeah. but there were all of the, there were so many pictures of me through like like uh, like there was a couple of frames on that mental I think we only zoom in on the one mm-hmm. but it was like me throughout you know like I was I think there was a picture of me 5 and 8 and 13 and 20 um, so you're confronted so, with yourself so was it, so was there, you know what I mean there was there, there was like a version or there was like a version yeah. of the cut where I was like who who is George and I go is it him is it him is it him is it him and it was just those were like the versions of really just myself and the versions of like what any anybody goes through in those ages and it was that slow progression where it was just like, okay, cool. Like, even though it happened within one scene, it made sense. Like you said, the tantrum has to make sense. So if I went from zero to never having said anything to just leaving as a calm 21 year old, mm-hmm. don't follow me, mom, it wouldn't have made sense. So you yeah. kind of have to go through the gauntlet of everything. And then you see, you know, the same mistakes that uh, we make when, you know, we fall in love too quick and, you know, this, you know, a pretty girl picks you up and you, and you you end up in bed together and then you tell her that you're in love and then you have lice and then, <laughs> wait just me the life of an actor uh, no but it was just it's just um it was just uh, an excellent exercise in mm-hmm. examining oneself and to do it in a in a in a guided sandbox that uh that julia and, and kim created and to get to do that with uh, with another actor who you trust so much and who's not afraid to get immediately vulnerable with you and and uh, and help you through that and hold your hand and give you her heart and and receive yours. It was it was it was really cool. It was a it was a 
I mentioned this earlier in another interview, but I will I will always look at my career in terms of the before and after with London Major Oregon. Perfect. Right. Thank you so much, both of you, for Thank talking you. with me. And such I haven't I've been so open with your answers and everything. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much for all your really wonderful that and prescient and thoughtful questions. Thank I really you. appreciate that it. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You like cared so much. Yeah. It's just Thank it. yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. So everyone, that was this episode of Carolina Talks. And in this episode I spoke with the actor Hamza Hawk and actress Anna McGuire about their film with love and a major organ which is being released into Canadian theaters April 10th which is the day that I'm, pro- I'm publishing this so I really hope you enjoyed this interview it was really good to talk to them and we were able to record the session um but that was fine and you'll see like if you watch it if you go on the YouTube channel you'll see like I put up clips of the film instead but I really enjoyed them taking the time to speak with me and it was great to talk to them in person because I don't normally get to interview people in person if it's not festival oriented so it was great to talk to them in person as well and you can find this in other episodes of course on um and you'll of course find other interviews with uh, film creators around the world on for on Carolyn Talks podcast and so here's what happened as you've noticed I've kind of changed up the title for it because the sense it's now more my podcast and so here's what happened so it's now the Karen and Talks podcast and if you go on my YouTube channel youtube.com slash at sign Carolyn underscore Hines you'll see that it's changed to Carolyn Carolyn Talks podcast and YouTube channel but it's still the same I just changed up the title a little bit you know help with SEO help people find it find it a bit easier and you'll see of course, other interviews that I did for AFCA virtual roundtables for the um, Toronto International Film Festival, Sundance, South by Southwest. If you go to my R3 page, it's authroy.com. You'll find all of my published work there as well. And if you go to kcrush.com and go and look in filmmaker interviews, you'll see interviews that I've done for the Busan International Short Film Festival, the Busan International Film Festival, Jeonju Film Festival, and other uh, festival coverage that I've done for Crush as well. And um, on social media, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Carrie, C-N-H-12, that's C-A-R-R-I-E-C-N-H-1-2. Find links to my work there and see, on Twitter. You'll see me talking about all kinds of stuff, not just films. And um, of course, I'll, politics now, you know, pro-Palestine, yeah, free Palestine, Congo genocide, like pay attention to those kind of things and like what's going on in Haiti and Congo and Sudan. And I try to make my social media as representative of who I am as a person so I talk about a whole range of things and um and that's the way to get to know me as well and I think that's important you know like I who I am as a person is influenced by my work as a film critic and a journalist and my work as a film critic and journalist is influenced by who I am as a person so there's that but um until the next episode of Karen and Talks everyone stay safe bye